no, no, don't worry about it, Rebecca. Honestly, you're irrepressible. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Except a no from you just repressed yeah, yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm really delighted to be here, and I know all of you are interested in questions of education, So, and I know you've thought about it a lot and been reactive in it, so I'm not going to um, repeat everything, but I do think it's important that we gather um, now and then, often, and figure out how to um, how to kind of resist the juggernaut that Alan was beginning to describe. How do we resist it? And and what are the terms on which we're going to, you know, fight back? Uh, the last time I was in Madison was, um, I was circling the Capitol. I came up several times and couldn't have been happier, uh, especially seeing groups of nurses and teachers with Cairo in Wisconsin signs. I thought, wow. Um, what an amazing kind of a, a moment. And we need not only more of that, but we need more creative uh, resistance. And so I want to talk a little bit about what I think, I want to try to name the moment in this kind of school reform debate um, very briefly. I want to talk about how I think we need to reframe the issues and, and, and struggle in this moment. And then we're going to talk among ourselves. You're going to each say a word. And then we really are, all three of us, interested in conversation. Um, that gets, you know, that goes deeper. Um, so, I guess I'll start by saying that I think that um, uh, that it's an astonishing moment uh, in schools when a couple of things are going on. One is that, um, as Alan said, public schools are under attack in a way, in ways that were unthinkable not so long ago, and the way the issue has been framed lowers our imaginative horizons dramatically and p perhaps fatally. So a, a perfect example to me was a recent article in the New Yorker, a pub piece about Arne Duncan. Some of you might have seen it, beautiful picture, he looked lovely. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and like his boss, he's a pragmatic, very intelligent, you know, in, uh, intellectual and compassionate guy. But the, the, the profile of Arnie was kind of um, perfectly revealing. Because the author said, the author's name was Carlos R Rotella. And what the author argued was that there are really two positions in the school reform struggles in the United States today. Two positions. One, he calls the radical reformers, who want to privatize the schools, crush the unions, create vouchers or charters, um, and, and uh, see this as a, and, and market-based solutions. That's one poll in the debate. The second poll is those who defend the status quo. Uh, love the colleges of education, love the teachers union, just think everything's going great. Having never met anybody in that poll, <laughs> maybe there's somebody here, I don't know. Um, it, it, it was an astonishingly revealing kind of, um, kind of uh, statement of, of where we are because if you have to choose between those two polls, people like me and probably most of you have nowhere to go. So I wrote letters to the New Yorker that they failed to publish, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but what I argued in, in my response to that was that this is another example of framing the issue in a way that we're sure to be defeated. Those of us who believe that there can be a humanistic, um, uh, democratic, progressive, um, approach to education, we're sure to be defeated if that's the framing. And framing is everything in a certain sense. You know, when, whenever a politician during the last presidential campaign got to the podium and said, we need to get the lazy, incompetent teachers out of the classroom, didn't you feel yourself nodding dully? I mean, I did. What am I going to say? My granddaughter deserves the laziest and most incompetent teacher. <laughs> they win because they frame the issue. And if I got to the podium first and said, every kid in a, in a public school deserves a compassionate, caring, intellectually grounded, interesting, um, uh, well-paid and well-rested teacher in the classroom, I'd win too. So the question is, why can you know, part of the question is, why are we not framing the issues and how do we reframe when the noise and the, and the you know, thunder from above is telling us what the horizons of our imaginations can be. This, this to me is like the, one of the biggest challenges we face is this question of rethinking, reframing. So here's my reframing. The frame that we're stuck in 
is the idea that schools are like, like uh, a market, that education is a market, that schools are, you know, that it's like you buy education at the marketplace like you buy a refrigerator or a stove or a box of bolts. It's that kind of thing. That, that, um, and if that's the case, if that metaphor is the case, then people like Michelle Rhee, people like um, uh, some of the other, Joel Klein, Michael Bloomberg, these people make sense because you might remember right the week after uh, the last presidential election, there was a Time cover story with Michelle Rhee on the cover. And she looked, you know, ready to kill. She had the black power suit on and her broom in her hand and she was standing in a kind of a stereotypical classroom. And the article, the, the title of the article was, um, uh, was Michelle Rhee uh, sweeps out the, the old and brings in the new. And the pivotal paragraph in the, in the article said that Michelle Rhee has done more in a year and a half to reform the Washington, D.C. schools than most reformers have done in five years. And then it says, colon, she's fired 39 principals, closed 30 schools, fired 150 teachers, and fired 200 central office staff. Now, there's not a word in there about parent engagement. There's not a word in there about relevant curriculum. There's not a word in there about bringing resources into this starving system. There's nothing beyond the idea that if it's a business model, if it's like GM, then she was doing just what she should do, privatizing, downsizing, and so on. But the problem is that the frame that they're using is a frame that I think we all reject. It's a frame we can't buy into, and therefore we have to find a different frame. So the way I think of it often is if somebody dropped down from another planet or another world and went into a typical American classroom, would they know for certain that they were in a democratic or an authoritarian society? What would they know by just stepping into a classroom? And it's relevant because every school, every educational system is in many ways mirror and window into the society that it serves. So in an agrarian society, in a, in a farming community, kids are brought up to learn how to farm, take care of animals and crops. In a kingdom, People are taught fealty. Uh, in a theocracy, they're taught, uh, you know, to obey. And in any authoritarian system, people are taught whatever else they're taught. They're taught obedience and conformity. So if you think about any school system anywhere at any time, you can see something about the society. In the old South Africa, if you wanted to know what apartheid was, all you had to do was to peek into the schools. In the African schools, you would find kids, you know, you'd find 85 kids to a class. You'd find no roof on the ceiling, on the, uh, on the building. You'd find, um, you know, no textbooks, nothing up to date, and so on. In the schools for white kids, European, uh, you know, background kids, you'd find small classes, fully resourced. You'd find um, well-trained teachers at a class size of 12. Only seeing that, you would know what apartheid is. And seeing, it, or if you knew what apartheid was, you could predict that that's what the schools would look like. You would have a sharecropper education, or in this case, an education for the prisons and the mines for some, for the majority of kids. And a, and a uh, I mean a school for the, for the prisons and the mines, and the mines, or for the kids who were gonna run the society, you'd have a, a system that had them, you know, making decisions and running things with all the racialized, you know, stereotypes built in. Any school, any school system reflects the society it's in. That's an uncomfortable thing for us to think about because we want to think that we're at least an aspirational democracy. But if we take as a starting point that in a democracy, we start with the premise, fragile and difficult, but it's a premise that every human being is of incalculable value. Every human being is of incalculable value. And what that means is that the, the fullest development of each individual is the condition for the full development of all of us. And conversely, the fullest development of all of us is the condition for the full development of each of us. That's the ideal. We can ask ourselves, how do we measure up? But this has huge implications for policy. Huge implications for policy. Because 
it means that in a city like Chicago, you can't have one school that's funded at the, to the tune of $30,000 or $35,000 per kid per year, and another school funded to the tune of $4,000 per kid per year. But that's exactly what we have, and that's exactly what's not on the table when the framing of the education debate is as I said it is you know, in the beginning. Those kinds of questions are on the table. So in policy terms, this kind of notion of democracy, of equity, of recognition, of fairness, of um, equality, it's belied by a system that, you know, that, that is that grotesquely unequal. And don't think that kids don't see it. Those kinds of savage inequalities, as Jonathan Kozel pointed out 15 years ago, are well known to the kids. They're not stupid. They open their eyes and they can see it. And what we're saying to kids very clearly is we have a very, very simple policy when it comes to education and childhood. And our policy is choose the right parents. If you choose the right parents, you're going to be fine. Everything will be good. You'll live in a safe neighborhood. You'll have access to libraries. You'll have access to books. You'll have access to the lake. You'll have access to museums. But if you choose the wrong parents, well, shame on you. We can't do a damn thing about it. And that's freedom, and that's the kind of rhetoric, even, that we're being yet. Yeah, the interesting thing on the rhetoric, to me, what's interesting on the rhetoric is that the, the kind of people who are pushing this privatization that Alan referenced and referred to, the people pushing that do not push it under the language of market and so on. They push it under the language of social justice. We should claim a little victory there, shouldn't we? I mean, <laughs> it seems to me that they're saying this is the new, look, Teach for America is the new civil rights movement. It's the new civil rights movement. And you say, really? I mean, who's the enemy? The enemy is black kids who are lazy. Well, damn, you know, and families who don't care, and so on and so on. So I think that we have to note that nobody's having this argument without referencing civil rights and social justice and so on but they're doing it in a way that masks the reality of what's going on. So choose the right parents is the policy thing. But if we take as a premise that, the, that every human being is of incalculable value, that has huge implications for curriculum and teaching as well. And that's often missed in this argument, in this discussion. It has huge implications because, as I said, in any authoritarian or autocratic system, whether it's Germany in the 30s or Albania in the 70s or <laughs> South Africa, or Saudi Arabia today, those systems, whatever else they teach, and frankly, they were very successful in teaching a lot of things, you know, language, math, science, you know, a lot of things. But whatever else they taught, they taught obedience and conformity. And in a school, in a school system that's based on democratic values, whatever else we teach, we must teach creativity, initiative, courage, imagination, and so on. And that means, for example, shredding the arts from the schools is a travesty. It's a, it's a frontal assault on democracy, on, on democratic schooling. So the idea that, well, these poor kids don't know how to, how to read, and, and they come from homes that have a high noise level, or whatever the nonsense that I hear. And, and they say, well, we can't, don't have time for sports, clubs, games, um, the arts, music, we only have time to put on our uniforms and drill and skill and drill and skill. I think we need to very seriously challenge that is if it comes masquerading in the language of democracy and freedom. That is not democracy. It is not freedom. It's not teaching imagination and courage. One of the ways, here's a, a, another point about how to oppose what I think is this very dangerous and highly successful assault on public schools. Another thing we have to say again and again is, if it's not good enough for your kids, you reformers, then how can it be good enough for somebody else's kids? So you look at Bloomberg, Reed, uh, Klein, um, Gates, Broad, all these people. Number one, they went to private schools. Number two, they would never allow their kids to go to a school where there wasn't the arts. You look at, I mean, Take the Obama kids, who are lovely kids, lovely family. God bless them all. When they were in Chicago, they went to the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools, where Artie Duncan went for 12 years. And what did they find there? They found small class size, capped at 15 in the high school. No more than 15 students per. 
well-resourced classrooms, teachers who were not only respected, but hold your breath, unionized. <laughs> unionized. <laughs> my kids, incidentally, went to that high school as well. And during the time my kids were there, um, they went on strike. And the parents supported the strike. What were they striking about? They didn't want two more kids in the class. Right on, <laughs> right on. So how do we have policy that on the west side of Chicago, second grade can go up to 35 kids to class? Does that make a difference? You bet it makes a difference. And what is Rahm Emanuel's response, our new mayor? His response is, we need a 90-minute day. That'll solve the problem. Nothing about poverty, nothing about class size or school size, nothing about curriculum or parental involvement, just 90 more minutes of more meaningless nonsense will somehow be the social justice answer to everything we're facing. We need to oppose that. So when the Obamas moved to DC, and there was all this speculation in the press, where will the girls go to school? Where will the girls? There was no doubt in my mind, they were going to Sidwell Friends. What they find at Sidwell Friends? Class size capped at 12. Well-resourced classrooms. A curriculum based in part on pursuing your own questions and, and researching your own interests. Um, teachers who were highly trained, respected, and unionized. So we need to get over this idea that somehow, because they put these things on the table, that that's actually what makes sense. What makes sense is to say, in a democracy, whatever the wisest and most privileged parents have for their children, we as a community demand as a starting point for all of our children. Small class size, unionized teacher corps that's well paid and well rested, um, and has time to think because it's a thinking profession, because it requires a thoughtful, caring person to do it well. And these are the things we need to foreground in this debate. Again, interesting, if you were, some of you might have been at the SOS rally and, and the Save Our Schools rally in DC this summer. One of the interesting things about it was that it freaked out the administration completely to the point that, that the Secretary of Education was pursuing Matt Damon like a, like a jilted lover. And, he was, like, and he, he was like racing around trying to get Matt Damon to return his calls. And Matt Damon, who's a bit more sophisticated than that, finally when he got him on his cell phone, Matt Damon said to the secretary, I'm happy to meet with you. I'll meet with you after the rally, and I'm bringing everybody with me. And that's, that's the right answer, because had he met with him before the rally, Duncan would have issued a press release saying, I met with them, I completely concur with the values and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Nonsense. We need to call them on this. And the merry band of billionaires who are driving this thing, the interesting thing about it is that they don't have everybody and they have not captured the imaginations of everybody. And even though you may feel small and insignificant, the fact is that they are really fighting a minority position, they're fighting from a minority position, and they have not convinced most people at all. So my last word on this before we open up a bit more is that I think one of the things that we have many, many obstacles, we have many, many, it's kind of a, a multi-armed monster that we're fighting, it's a hydra. Uh, you cut off one head and two more heads appear. And it's easy enough for people like us to look at the Hydra and say, well, it's the billionaires, it's the Broad Foundation, and it's the Gates Foundation, and it's those bad guys, and it's the anti-union politicians, and it's the Tea Party. But there's something we don't look at closely enough, and that's it, the extent to which we are the problem, that we ourselves are the problem. And there's two ways, maybe three ways, that we create the problems for ourselves. One is that we lack confidence. We don't actually believe that we can be heard if we speak up. We feel defensive, and we then barricade ourselves and speak from the position of being barricaded rather than the position of actually being in the mainstream. And I'm quite serious about this. I'm going to give you one example. Um, but the other piece of that is more or less the same point, but from a different angle, is that sometimes we feel in places like Madison and Ann Arbor and Hyde Park that these ideas are so complicated and precious that only we can understand them. And that's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. So take the question of, of the teachers' unions. You know, and, and I, I, I have to admit a, a certain ambivalence, no ambivalence at this moment, 
But, but I grew up in the 60s, and I remember too vividly the 68 teacher strike in New York. Teachers are and can be a progressive force, but they must be aligned with students and community. They can't be against the community and be a progressive force, and we can talk that back and forth. But I was speaking in Georgia, and, and a, a, a Tea Party person asked me the question, you know, how can you defend teachers' unions? How can you possibly, there are a bunch of lazy, incompetent teachers that they're protecting, you know? And you think again, think back on the New Yorker articles over the last three years, the rubber room. I don't know if you remember this one, but there's a room where teachers who are on suspension go and collect their, you know, their wages while they're waiting to be adjudicated. And the New Yorker runs this as an example of just what a horrible thing. It's talking about 15 teachers in a system of a half a million, you know, they're talking about, you know, a, a half a million, million kids, right? And, and they're talking about um, a system that was, that's due process, that was negotiated with the board. It's not just the union. I mean, that's the other thing people forget. But in any case, this guy said, well, how can you defend teachers unions, you know? And I said, well, it's simple. You know, good, good working conditions are good teaching conditions. And good teaching conditions are good learning conditions. How do you get good working conditions? And I gave an analogy. If, 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 I'm, if I've got a fire in my house, and the firefighters are trying to figure out the procedure to put out that fire, I hope their procedures that they've written down, their benchmarks and their standards, have been worked out with firefighters in the conversation about how to fight a fire. <laughs> Who do I want? Rob Emanuel in the conversation? <laughs> Absolutely not. You know, I don't care if he's in it at all. But I'm willing to say, yes, the politicians have to be in it, the administration has to be in it, but are you telling me you would allow standards to be written for fighting fires in Chicago without the firefighters? You'd be nuts. Well, the same is true of teachers. You're going to put standards in there for teachers and what it means to be a teacher? And those of us who've been doing this for years, some of us decades, those of us who went to school for years, who practiced the craft under great and dire circumstances, including my son Malik uh, in Oakland, California, being a 10-year teacher, being pink-slipped every year for the last three years, and then getting rehired at the last minute. That's the kind of disrespect that we give this profession. And then we say, oh, but they should never unionize, just be contract workers. Teach for America. The average life expectancy of a Teach for America teacher is three years. I know from experience it takes three to five years to get your feet under you as a teacher. And then, if you're still willing to learn and grow and stuff, then you can really get at it. But now we're saying, not we, but the, the people, the big reform push from the right says, really what we need is just a bunch of short-termers who come through very quickly. That is a ridiculous prospect, and it's ridiculous for people like the children of Bill Gates and Barack Obama. So it's ridiculous for our kids as well. Thanks very much.